So I would love to talk a little bit um, about Twitter because it is November 15th. Um, we don't, I don't, I don't want to get into like, oh, this happened and this happened and this happened, but you and I first met on Twitter. We did. You got me my first DevRel job via Twitter. So <laughs> lots of love and appreciation for Twitter in general, but I know for both of us, Twitter has been a big part of our DevRel careers. Yes. And so just what, what does this mean? Let's, let's just say like Twitter will go down and come back in some other form. We don't know what that is, but like, what does this mean for DevRel? Because I feel like data science, machine learning DevRel is very Twitter focused. Yes, definitely something that I've been thinking about. Um, and I feel like the two main uses of Twitter for me are a, um, I guess collegial interaction, right? Like being able to talk with peers, even if I'm not, you know, physically there, which I haven't been recently. Um, and to be frank, kind of don't think that I'm going to continue to be in the future. Um, so that's one big thing, right? Like being able to talk to folks in just like an informal back and forth way. Um, and I think, you know, history of the internet, there's always been something like that, right? Like IRC, you know, AOL Messenger, um, Right. Twitter is not the new thing. The new thing is now that all of those things are a little bit more public, you know, Usenet groups. Um, and then the other thing is as a place to find information as an information aggregator. Um, and certainly what I'm doing is I am splitting those functions. So, I mean, I am, hi, yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you want to come up? With yeah, I'm just gonna lift you yeah, up we so love you can pets. see. Let's say hi, this is so <laughs> sleepy. Can we get a formal introduction? Oh my gosh. Oh, no. Yeah. I would get nothing done. <laughs> I know. This is Banson. He's very sleepy and he wants oh. me to put him back down so he can go back to sleep. Now. Okay. Well, but, it was nice meeting you. Well, he's a little chihuahua mix. So he loves to be a left dog. Uh, right. So the two functions, right? Like yeah. I want to chit chat with people and I also want to like, know, know what's going on. Um, and the chit chatting with people, um, you know, I think I've, sort of committed to Mastodon at the moment. We'll see how, how it goes. Uh, I'm sure some people will go to Reddit. Machine Learning Reddit has never been a place where I feel comfortable <laughs> and welcome. Let me put it that way. Um, I'm sure some people are going to, to Discords um, and sort of more, more private servers um, for, for that sort of collegial interaction. Um, I know, you know some people are going back to conferences in person, which like I said, I'm not doing. Um, but I think some people are getting that, that need filled that way. Um, I think it's just begun to become a little bit less centralized. I think we're going to see more, you know, uh, more little areas of discussion in different places, which honestly, in terms of what I like in social media is my preference. Uh, I know when we were talking for my channel, we talked a little bit about sort of like compartmentalizing and like I use different social media platforms for different things. Um, so that's the one side, that's the chit chat. <laughs> and the other side is uh, learning new things and aggregating them. Uh, and for that, um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously uh, newsletters are going to take some of that burden. Um, you know, I think I know a lot of people have like run up some stacks uh, recently if they didn't already have one. Um, definitely part of that. Uh, obviously not as good for things that are happening faster right and i think that's the mm -hmm. thing that we are losing now is a way to like quickly broadcast things as they happen um so uh for example the tornado right like we we had to reschedule yes. this because i had a, a tornado warning the one where like we can see the spinny thing yeah why <laughs> it's like your basement watch versus warning i lived in dallas for eight years tornado country still cannot tell you and there's like all these analogies and i'm like let's just change the name but yes, yes. watch you had the one where it's like it's coming yes yes, yes. but we mean it <laughs> yeah um yeah and the the tornado sirens were going on off in our in our area wah, wah, wah. anyway yeah. very um you know uh guarding, <laughs> very much a uh, bracing sound. Yeah. Um, and that's the sort of thing, I just don't know where that's gonna go, right? Like, is microblogging and real-time microblogging continuing to, going to continue to be a thing long-term? Because Mastodon's very decentralized. Like that is the point yeah. of the Fediverse is that it is yeah. decentralized. Um, 
are we going to see competitors swooping in? Is like Snap going to get into that space? Is TikTok, God forbid, going to get into that space? Um, sorry, that was, um, I don't have an issue with short form video. TikTok is a tech company. I trust zero. <laughs> and I, there's a not. lot. Yeah. There's like a lot of privacy issues with yeah. TikTok. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, which not, you know, similarly Facebook, right? I, mm-hmm. um, also don't trust Facebook. Right? Listen, not- data, our data is for sale, right? Oh, like awesome. whatever you do, we are being, not to be a conspiracy theory. And I don't feel this is conspiracy theory. No, but we mean, saw like- Data broker is a type of company. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you can, I actually pay money every month to a company to remove my data from things, right? Oh, um, your, your phone tracks mm-hmm. you, it tracks your movement. It was used during early days of COVID. We started looking at phone data to see where people were and how they were moving. So like data is, personal data is a business. And I think, yes. yeah, there's, everyone is allowed to have concerns about how their data is is used. So yeah, and I TikTok, I don't, I don't see as a way, like what you're talking about is so important, right? This, this way, not just- It was Twitter did. It was, it, yeah, so Twitter- <laughs> was so good is at, um, during times of crisis of keeping people informed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there was largely a sense of, hey, this emergency is happening, like divert resources to that. Mm -hmm. Um, Twitter has been my source of information for public health around COVID. Same, yeah, definitely. Especially the epidemiologists that I followed because of my, you know, my staff graduate work. Yeah. Or like the protests in Iran, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, here's a great one. The the protests in Nigeria that affected tech workers so much. Like Twitter was how I found out about it and was like able to keep up with it. And um, yeah, I don't know that we're going to continue to have that public square. And here's the thing, like Twitter, the platform's still there. Mm -hmm. As a community member, my trust in the platform is rapidly going away. Like I am double verifying things now. Like I used to like, you know, click links, double check, but like I'm being like much more careful now with what I, you know, what I shared. Cause I mean, there's yeah. the blue check debacle, two factor, two factor authentication was broken. We were just talking about before the call, uh, reports are that they don't have a data protection officer and are like flagrantly in violation of GDPR. Um, we'll see, uh, obviously I shouldn't say obviously, but it sounds like they might be violating their consent decree. Um, so in terms of user trust and safety, I think we're losing that. In terms of you know the technical capabilities of the platform continuing to exist, <laughs> that is like the thing I worry about in DevRel is that one day I'm going to try to log on to Twitter and it's going to be a blank screen, and we yeah. don't know. There's no warning for that, yeah, and you know, in the in terms of DevRel, it is it is not the end of the world. We we will go on. And I've, I've heard people talk about all of these other platforms and this kind of fragmentation that's happening as lifeboats. They mm-hmm. may not be permanent homes, but they're ways for us to stay connected to our data community until yeah. we figure out the next steps. So, so we've talked, you know, in your, when we were on your channel, we talked a little bit, we got into this mode of like aunties talking about early career <laughs> data scientists and career transitioners. And you have, I don't know if this was given publicly or if it was just internal, but you have a talk called put a bird on it. Right. And so this is going back to your Kaggle days. Um, And it was, it's this beautiful slide deck and it's about putting your Twitter handle on every slide and like anything you do, put your Twitter handle on it. Right. Like Twitter is the way to get your, I mean, I got my job at Kaggle through Twitter. Mm -hmm because mm-hmm. of our connection. What advice do you have for someone earlier in their data science career who is trying to break into DevRel or even data science right now in terms of getting their work seen and noticed? Great question. I mean, I wouldn't put that much weight on Twitter right now. I mean, remains to be seen, right? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of platforms that are really focused on helping people get stuff out there. So I would probably steer away from medium because of the paywall issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so dev.2 does a lot of really good, like it's, it's a very focused, right? It's on developers. <laughs> they do a lot of like promoting of the, the developer content that folks write on there. Lots of like early career folks get like blog posts boosted by them. Um, so I think that's a good place to do, do blogging. Um, I mean, <laughs> Uh, obviously we both have an institutional link to Kaggle. Uh, so yes. like, <laughs> uh, but that is a good place to build mm-hmm. a portfolio. Um, I would say my main advice, particularly if you think you might be interested in going in the DevRel direction is don't become too dependent on a platform, right? Which like, obviously Twitter was 
and continues to be for now, right? My main platform. I've got Twitter, I've got Mastodon. Um, but I also have my personal website that like I host and run myself. Um, definitely good to get help, right? Very important. Um, if you're really in the sort of ML ops, uh, ML side of things, maybe uh, being a little bit more active on hugging face. It seems like there's a lot of activity there right now. So that might be a good place. Um, uh, if you're interested in video, uh, so one thing that I do is I stream when I stream both to Twitch and YouTube. Twitch doesn't hold on to videos anymore. So I recommend definitely doing something that's a little bit more archival. Um, if you are interested in video and streaming, um, that does mean you can't become an affiliate or a partner because that has an exclusivity requirement for the content. Uh, but for me, that's worth it because I'm I'm not as interested in building up, you know, my uh, like just my YouTube channel, right? Mm -hmm. Just my Twitter, just my Twitch. I'm really interested in creating a lot of ways for people to um, interact with what I'm providing and what I have to say, and then my main, you know. Because right now I'm I'm working independently. I'm not working for a company. Um, I'm doing you know contract work here and there. But um, the main way that I'm supporting my my Deborah work is through uh, a coffee, which is like Patreon, um, but takes less fees. <laughs> uh, to be perfectly perfectly blunt about it, um, is a coffee, and then people are supporting me. So that's like mm -hmm. I'm not interested in getting Twitter ad revenue, which is is small. It's small. It's small. small. It's small. Uh -huh. And Twitch Twitch payouts are small. Um, yep. as well right so partnering with the platform mm -hmm. um you hear about all these people they're big streamers on twitch and then twitch changes their revenue plan and now all of a sudden you are making a fraction of what you were making last month yeah, absolutely. um yeah there's definitely something in there about controlling as much as you can some level and yeah. i love your recommendation for kaggle i think that was one thing that really surprised me when i started there mm -hmm. was finding out that people get hired from kaggle Oh, yeah, like the platform, not I mean, people obviously working at Kaggle can go on to other jobs, but speaking as a Kaggler, as someone who is curating data sets, um, writing really good notebooks, that alone can help you get noticed. That can be a great place to point to your portfolio of work. Um, and I think that's because it's not just competitions, you know, my little Kaggle plug. It's not just competitions. Competitions are great, but there are ways to engage in DevRel style work that I think are really Absolutely. important. So yeah, um, and build links in a in a community, right? Like that's yeah. that's the thing that I'm most interested in, right? It's I, I say on my channel, like I'm interested in language technology and other people. I want to build links with other people and people who care about what I have to say, right? Like I'm not going to go to a dog fancier's YouTube channel and be like, check out my video <laughs> on NLP. <laughs> <Is that> NLP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so finding people who are already interested in the sort of things that you're talking yeah. about. Um, is really powerful, which is why Kaggle is helpful, which is why mm -hmm. Dev.2 is helpful. It's because that's a a narrow focus in the community. Mm -hmm. Not that narrow, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's not, you're not publishing on Medium, you're publishing exactly. on a platform for mm -hmm. data science and machine learning. And so in all of this content, you've mentioned NLP mm -hmm. um, and you have, a, you have a tagline or a catchphrase in this goal of making NLP boring. Yeah. But, yeah. okay, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> NLP, what is NLP and why is there so much hype around it? Great question. So NLP, natural language processing, is um, the name of a field that used to be called computational linguistics and has sort of um, also human language technology. Sometimes you'll hear that. Um, and it is generally the field that works with text data um, in a computational setting, very broad, I know, uh, but traditionally at least NLP didn't work with speech data, for example, it didn't really work with sign language data. Mm. Um, it was really focused on text specifically, and now the, the, the borders are getting a little bit fuzzier. Um, so that's the, the general field. Um, some, you know, key, um, you know, NLP things you're probably familiar with from sort of the early history of the field, things like spell check, right? Things mm. like um, autocompletes, so things like, um, you know, uh, those sort of like search recommendations on, on Google. Um, uh, if you've ever used, uh, you know, some sort of ontology or semantic search, like a library website, trying to find like a specific piece of information, those are sort of like NLP adjacent. Uh, so that's the general field. Um, and NLP as sort of uh, adjacent to um, machine learning in general has, like machine learning, gone through a lot of the same winters and summers uh, or springs as you'll hear people talk about them. So 
way back in the you know 60s, 70s, people started to get really excited about it. Um, so that was in the, you know, if you've heard of Eliza, it was one of the first conversational chatbots where you could say something and it would respond and you could say anything, right? You didn't have to like press the number to pick your, your thing. Um, and this was back in the day of rules and parsing. So nothing machine learning, nothing fuzzy, nothing stochastic, 100% rule-based um, and taking, you know, uh, uh, text input, uh, inferring the internal structure of it and making transformations to that internal structure. Um, and then it turned out that there were limitations to that technology and it could only do so much. And then people lost interest and all the money went away. Um, and then that, that sort of pattern generally happened a couple of times. Uh, and now obviously we're in, well, up to, you know, a couple months ago, <laughs> we were in a situation where people were very excited about it and there was a lot of money. Um, and I, you know, if there's one thing that you can bet on, it's that there will be a boom and bust cycle in technology, right? Like, yeah, looking back in history, yep, sure is. Uh, that is a general pattern that you can pretty much rely on. Um, and in, so there was uh, sort of two waves in the 2000s, 2010s. Um, and the first was taking uh, sort of traditional uh, methods, statistical methods in NLP and beginning to add uh, more deep learning methods, right? So we started to get cheaper compute, mm -hmm. things could be parallelized, these neural networks that you know people had been proposing for a couple of decades suddenly became tractable, not because anything in the underlying algorithm changed, but rather because we now have the compute and the money for it. Yeah. Um, and so you got sort of the, the wave of neural networks coming into the field. Um, and then in 2017, we got the transformer paper. Um, and with the neural network applications, they were still generally custom built. They were still very narrow domain focused. So nobody was really working on or successfully working on, I should say, general purpose models. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2017, we got the transformer paper, the Viswani et al. paper, um, which was uh, originally machine translation, but was then extended into um, language modeling. Uh, and language modeling is this very open-ended, uh, very sort of generic type of way of, of doing NLP tasks um, and has had some success, particularly in, in leaderboard. Um, you know, based applications, but it's also been folded into a lot of commercial products as well. Um, and with that transformation, those two phases of transformation, so first from more statistical rule-based models um, to, well, the statistical models were fuzzy, they weren't all rule-based, but those were sort of the two yeah. things that we were talking about, into neural models, and then finally into transformers, which each of those steps, you got a bunch of renewed interest in the field as systems became more flexible. Um, and also a lot of people who didn't have a lot of grounding in language as an object of study. Um, and with that sort of like rush of funding, there also came a lot of hype. There also came a lot of, particularly in the commercial space, people misrepresenting the capabilities of their systems. Um, people, uh, you know, wanted to get funding. And um, I'm not saying that this is true of everybody in the field, but there were certainly unscrupulous or uninformed folks who uh, genuinely misled people about what NLP could do. And it, it's, you know, still has this sort of like, and we're seeing the same thing right now with like the image generation stuff. It's got sort of like a, a magical hypey sort of like, yeah. oh, it's so cool. Oh, it's so neat. Um, and I don't want to like downplay the, uh, the, the changes that we've made, the new approaches that, you know, have, have been developed as a field and the amount of work mm -hmm. that people have done. That's great. Uh, I'm not unhappy that there's more people in the field, right? I, language is so important to me and language technology is so important to me and so important to, you know, modern society as a whole. I'm not upset about that. I am upset about people who are more interested in grabbing your attention than being mm. honest with you. And that's where the making it boring comes again, right? <laughs> like, um, the majority of the actual work that goes into building NLP systems, the majority of the actual labor is still, you know, low level, fine grain human labor, especially labelers, right? NLP, like any machine learning field these days, runs on human labor that's often obfuscated away behind, oh, it's AI, oh, these magical models. Um, and I think that that leads people to have, um, it's just to misinform people about the capabilities of the system, what they require to work, um, the true costs of the system. There was a paper that came out today, I think actually, or at least I, I read about today. Is this about CLAP? See, it's uh, like a clip. It's something like this is me having like scanned something. Someone shared a paper <laughs> in Slack and I was, they were like clip now clap. And, and I was like, wait, I'm talking to an NLP person. And then 
is this I the forgot to follow up climate uh modeling of bloom from the no. face people no different thing <laughs> um excited that i might know something like the day oh. it came out <laughs> you uh you knew about something before i did yeah i'm not familiar with this um but yeah, so the, the climate impacts of transformer okay. models, right? When we move from oh. stochastic systems to neural network systems, you know, orders of magnitude, more compute, mm -hmm. which requires electricity and water and has a big yeah. climate impact, transformers even more orders of magnitude of compute, right? So um, I, I, there was a, you know, a really nice project done recently that showed that a transformer-based model was you know, 800 times bigger <laughs> than an equivalent model uh, based on, I think LSTMs were there. Um, okay like the uh, benchmark. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So I don't think it's bad to be excited about things. Yeah. I think it is bad to be uncritical of things. And I think it is mm. um, I don't mean, not necessarily bad. Like I get why people do it, but particularly, you know, as engineers, as technical practitioners, we, we gotta, we gotta know. <laughs> we gotta well, know about what we're building and using, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's part of it. So I think, you know, my background is in biology and mm -hmm. biochemistry and kind of living systems and things like that. And it always, when you talk about labeling, um, I always think of like the saying garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah, so absolutely. everything that you put into your model is based on the quality like what your model outputs is based on the quality of what you input to your model. Yeah. And so when we think about labeling, um, it's really, can you talk a little bit about that? Like where, I mean, one, it's human labor. I'm mm -hmm. assuming it's a lot of like mechanical Turk, mm -hmm. things like that, where someone is just getting, what, what happens when someone is labeling audio or NLP data? Yeah, good question. It depends on the specific task, right? And I should say there's a couple different things that I'm thinking about here. So one is people who are working on training data. Uh, and the other is people who are particularly people who are doing content moderation uh, with the idea that it may eventually become training data. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there's also, I'm going to come back to the, the labeling, the training data, but speaking of content moderation, because I mean, um, Twitter just followed, just fired the majority of their content moderators, according to reports that I've read. Um, and, you know, we mentioned TikTok earlier. So the majority of content moderation that happens on TikTok is done by, you know, very poorly play, paid human workers, mm -hmm. usually in the global south. Um, and, and it's like is, the emotional, the devastating toll, like yeah. the things that we don't, every once in a while, I'll see something, something will slip through. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of, Horrifying. And then when you think like someone is paid poorly to sift through all of this horrible content so that I never have to see it. Um, it is, yeah, there's, there's a very real, this is not automated, right? Content no. moderation is not. No. Largely and they might automated. be able to do, you know, the first pass with automation, but the majority of content moderation, especially of video is just humans doing it. Um, so, and the, you know, the psychological toll of that is mm -hmm. it's immense unjustifiable right? and yeah it, yeah and like think about the amount of content i don't i don't know the statistics but if you think <laughs> about the amount of content that's produced right our at least our culture right now is very much in love with short snappy content that is easy it's fast and it's just like let's produce it right we are not currently in an age where we are enjoying prestige long-form content that takes months to create you know and, and it's a 20 to 40 minute video we are like TikTok, right i want two Absolutely. minutes or less make me laugh um so there's there's just an i can't even imagine the amount of content um that gets produced and it makes me think of so i am in the middle of reading neil stevenson's book fall um <laughs> which is, I, I love his work, but then it always ends up being like kind of true and it always makes me a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things they talk about is there are these characters who literally serve as personal editors, mm -hmm. right? So you have your ability to consume content, but you have an editor who is on call 24 seven who pre-sifts all of your stuff. So kind of mm -hmm. like a, a, a new version of an assistant. So not someone who just schedules your calls and your meetings and arranges your calendar, but is like filtering your news feed and, and curating the things that you should see. And that's like a service that you can pay for. Um, it's like, uh, you know, the, the Zoomer joke about my FBI agent. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, it is exactly. It's like that idea instead of an FBI, you know, and like depending on where you are in society and your level of wealth, you can get your own personal editor or there, if I'm remembering correctly, there are like editor farms who mm -hmm. may oversee, you know, 10 to 20 to hundreds of people's content. Whereas like, if you're wealthy and well off, you can get your personal editor to hand curate things. And I don't think that that is, you know, an impossible thing to imagine. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I do, right? On my YouTube <laughs> channel, one of the, I do two streams a week. And one of the streams is like, here's what I thought was interesting and relevant and it'll be today. And yeah. it, God, it takes so much work to put it together. <laughs> uh, this week, rather, rather. It's a, it's a weekly stream, but. Yeah. I mean, like even just curate, curating content is hard. So yes. being the person who is filtering content, who is doing content moderation, that's, that is going to be a challenging job. And then there, there are people labeling data, which is all, I mean, there's just so many things going into it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, machine learning research is expensive, right? The computer is expensive. The data is expensive. Yeah. Um, and people don't want to do boring, repetitive tasks, right? Like if you are doing something that is a good application of machine learning, um, it should be boring and repetitive <laughs> and fairly easy, right? Those are the things that are easy to automate. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things that, you know, if, if your goal is to make sure that people have to do less work, that's the thing you want to do, right? So a good example of this is a lot of the Zooniverse projects. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, I think it's an, it's an offshoot of Galaxy Zoo, which was like an early citizen science project where you like uh, click on and label different galaxy shapes with the idea oh, of training okay. machine learning model. Yeah. Um, so Zooniverse is specifically for researchers and it is, you're not paid for it, right? It is free. It is citizen mm -hmm. science. You are, you are doing it out of the goodness of your heart to, to help, you know, advance the cause of human knowledge. Um, science is expensive. Um, yeah, science, it is, it is, yes. The compute yes. everything. It's all expensive. And like I think it's easy to downplay because our phones are so powerful. And mm. yeah, it's expensive, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. These are expensive. Computers are expensive. Uh, and we sort of lost in NLP the idea that, you know, um, well, first of all, I should say most people working in NLP, certainly most researchers, don't have a lot of human subjects training if any, which has been, um, I've been an ethical reviewer a couple of times for different ACL conferences, which is fairly new, by the way, since I, I came to the field, that's something that has been added. And I believe NeurIPS also added ethical review as well. Um, and that's something that there's a lot, a lot of pushback towards against, pushback against, yeah, um, is the idea that we are working with human data and we should, you know, treat our um, I like to use the term data donors as <laughs> uh, people with agency uh, and, you know, individuals who deserve, yeah. um, you know, the same rights and, you know, remuneration, perhaps, the researchers do. Uh, not that researchers are necessarily paid that much. Um, mm -hmm. We are, well, we are recording this. It's currently during the, the UC strike. Yeah. There are a lot of... Uh, a side note, uh, researchers at companies generally are paid pretty well. Um, researchers, particularly graduate students and postdocs, are generally paid very, very poorly. Um, so when I was a graduate student, I actually, in Seattle, I applied to uh, public housing, <laughs> uh, and I didn't make enough to qualify. So just to give you an idea of sort of like the salaries that we're talking about uh, for some of these researchers are not high. Um, uh, but compared to sort of like the commercial research labs, which is the the sort of the shift in the field, right? We've moved from most work being done. Um, I mean, in the history of NLP, a lot of the early work was funded by uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, mm. um, especially like machine translation, right? Yeah. Specifically for defense ends. So in the history of the field, there is that like very close tie to the U.S. government. Um, and then there was sort of like, eh, the government was a little bit less interested. So we tended to get more folks working in universities. And then once, you know, commercial applications started to become more, you know, viable again, then we get, I wouldn't say the most, but like about a third of work is now done at commercial labs. And certainly the most impactful projects are done at commercial labs. And a lot of those projects are actually, um, uh, I forget who, where I first heard this this term, but are published by press release. So they don't go through peer review. I didn't know any of this. I so my back, you know, scientific publishing, right? Getting on a paper, like there's, there's a whole process and you have to do your data. You have to do your methods, like all of that. I just, yep. I just, here I am just assuming things. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. So not giving, yes. like choosing, choosing how you share information with the world. And I'm, I'm assuming if you're not beholden to R01 funding mm -hmm. um, and your funding comes from private sources, how you choose to disseminate your findings yes. now is, is 
largely up to you, right? You have different, yeah. you have choices. Particularly um, if you have a history of, you know, very clickbaity, sensational projects that, you know, newspapers love to publish because people read them. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. Like even GPT-3, right? The last time I looked into it, um, you couldn't get information on all the data that went into training GPT-3. You got some of it, <laughs> but they didn't tell you what 100% of the data is and where it was from, um, which, you know, perhaps that was an intentional choice on their part uh, to avoid answering questions that they would rather not have answered. Perhaps not. Who knows? Yeah. I don't, I'm not privy to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then that's sort of um, linked into this sort of prevailing attitude of like, you, you're, we're both from science backgrounds. Like I care deeply about you know, language technology and other people and language data, right? I'm a linguist by training, a social scientist by training. Um, it's important <laughs> where you get your data from. Um, and it affects everything that your model does downstream. Uh, and there's this sort of very free for all attitude that like anything anybody's posted on the internet, we can scrape and use, right? And certainly historically, court cases have certainly felt full in that way, um, but I don't think they're gonna keep falling that way to be perfectly honest. I, I think about that all the time. Um, yeah, how, like how easy it is to find me, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's something that I think, I think a lot, think about a lot in developer advocacy. You are in many ways a public face for mm -hmm. an organization and you are putting yourself out there um, and what you say and how you, it, in how you present yourself can be scrutinized. Yep. Um, and I think there is, that is something to think about for people who are thinking, oh, DevRel seems fun. Yeah. DevRel is not just writing blog posts. No. Um, I mean, it can be. If you get a job that is like writing blog posts under the company name, it's very, it's very different. And I'm not saying yes. those roles don't exist, but in many cases, DevRel is the person who is willing to give webinars or talks or be on <laughs> videos and podcasts and really put their name out there associated with things. Um, and just be aware of what, what that information can be used Absolutely. for. So, yeah. yeah. Like there's definitely enough of my voice data online that someone could do an extremely realistic voice clone of me. And that's just something that I've had to make my peace with. You do, yeah. There, there is this. Um, so this is something. This really ties into being a developer advocate, and I don't know how it how it is for you, mm -hmm. um, but I will say for myself. Sometimes it feels like my on like my entire online personality has to be consistent, and it has to be really focused on data science and machine learning. Is that something that that you found as well, or that you've experimented with? Yeah, good question. Um, I will say that. Uh, for the things that I do online that are related to data science and machine learning, I try to keep them pretty consistent. Uh, and when I am doing other things, I, you know, intentionally have sort of separate branding, <laughs> just to <laughs> bring, bring branding back into the discussion, um, but I intentionally separate them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a, a decision I've made. Uh, but also something that I've you know, I have a lot of interests. We're not really talking about many of them now, but like I have a lot of interests outside of technology. Um, and I've sort of been thinking about, uh, particularly now that, you know, I'm, I'm independent, I can do what I want. <laughs> uh, you know, folding those in a little bit more and really, I don't know, something that I've been really been thinking about is I kind of want to chase my bliss and I'm not entirely sure where my bliss is, right? But I want to like, you know, root around for it, like a, a, a pig hunting for truffles and see if I can yes. find, find a little something. Uh, so the, I'm a, currently my, I said I, I stream twice a week. My other stream is like, sometimes we do live coding, sometimes we read papers, we do different things. But right now I'm working on a live coding project um, around moon names. Um, okay. So um, particularly the traditional names of full moons in the Eastern United States, because I am a gardener. I'm really interested in gardening. Um, and I uh, I'm in a place where a lot of the, particularly like the older organic farmers, particularly, so I live in Richmond now, but I'm from uh, in the Piedmont, so closer to, to Appalachia, and that's where okay. my, uh, my husband's folks are from. Um, but there's something I almost never mentioned my husband <laughs> in, uh, uh, in my content. I just did, he, he's not relevant. Um, yeah, he's not. <laughs> uh, but uh, a lot of the sort of traditional, particularly older folks here will, they garden according to the moon. Um, and like 
the phases of the moon and some folks will like what sign is the moon in but also there are like names for the different full moons right like the strawberry moon the frog yeah. moon the harvest moon um and so I'm, I'm doing a project on my channel on like all right somebody told me to do something on the frog moon when is the frog moon <laughs> um and and trying to have like a, a little you know a nice little project where um we can I can, it's for me, but other people are welcome to use it once it's done and out there, um, you know, figure out what that means in Gregorian calendar dates. So that's obviously a part of my life that I don't talk much about online until recently. Um, I remember uh, I was having a a discussion with a professional uh, colleague a while ago and I mentioned something uh, and they just sort of paused for a couple seconds. And they were like, you know, I forget you have like a really rich life outside of tech. I think that's that yeah you have um you've met we we both have many interests outside of tech but Mm -hmm. in developer advocacy so much of our life is talking about tech and being good at tech and knowing what's happening in tech that it can Mm -hmm. be hard to um yeah I've even had people say to me like huh I didn't know you were funny (laughs) like okay first of all rude um (laughs) like or people will be like oh, I didn't know you liked film. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it is because, and, and then I do, you know, think about how many people do I do that to as well, right? Because yeah. what we show online is not always like the, the full self, but, but speaking of non-data science interests, you were the first person to introduce me to tabletop role-playing games. So you are a first, really? yeah, like you are well, a first right. for, yeah, for many of you. Yeah, mm-hmm. so you hosted Totally Real Human Adults and we played <laughs> three and three or four animals in a trench coat trying to get jobs as a data scientist. So I had a ton of fun. I'll post the link to the video. Um, but this world of, of tabletop role-playing games has always felt really inaccessible and overwhelming mm-hmm. to me. It's something that I didn't know about growing up. Um, and it wasn't until I was older and playing World of Warcraft and people were talking about Dungeons and Dragons. I'm um, going to insert something here that I think it's it. important that you know. The kids don't know about twinks. <laughs> I was talking with a friend. Like level 19, level 29, PvP. Are you serious? Is that what you're talking kids about? Don't know about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids don't know about twinking. I was talking with a friend uh, and he was like, Anyway, long story short, uh, I am also a person who has in my life played some MMOs. And uh, I was like, well, I don't know. If I started a new MMO, I'd probably like mm-hmm. you want to be, you know, twinked by a guild. And he was like, what? <laughs> so I did, um, I had this whole call with my friend Tanya that'll come out, um, it will have come out previous to this. And we we talk about World of Warcraft because she's playing WoW Classic and she builds shiny dashboards to help her guild allocate resources. <laughs> um, but then we were talking about like how we play and I was like, I can't believe I have to say this. So when we were talking about twinking, we were talking about um, playing at the max level of a bracket in PvP. So yes, is that has that disappeared? Or do people not I do that so. anymore? I oh. think so. I, I don't think the term is there. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It was, it was wild. I had to like... Yeah. So that was, that was a really, that's so funny. Cause that's the direction I'm going with this is like, it was, it's a good way to play a game and like mm-hmm. pause your experience and just kind of understand what's happening and get mm-hmm. your bearings. Um, and so I felt like I've been invited on a couple of like, I don't know, alternatives to D and D. And I'm like, they're like, I've stopped because they're like, okay, here are all the things you need to do for our first meeting. And I'm just like homework. Thank you. <laughs> I was, I don't understand. Like, what do you mean pick things? So like, what advice do you have people who are interested in maybe this world or some other nerdy hobby, like an an MMO, right? That seems really overwhelming Um, and they want to do it, but they don't know where to start. Great question. I also talk about tabletop because it's not like you've covered um, uh, MMOs recently. Uh, Yes. So the number one thing I would say is think about what you want out of the experience. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple, you know, there's a couple different sort of flavors of groups and everyone's going to have a bad time if you show up to a group expecting a different flavor of group. Right. Um, so uh, I would say the first flavor is like people who are really interested in collaborative storytelling. They really okay. want to do role playing. Um, they theater kids. <laughs> you know, um, Totally guilty. Yes. 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 Um, 
Uh, so that is one style of group. Uh, another style of group are, and I guess actually these just relate to two ends of the spectrum mm. and most people sort of fall somewhere in the in between, uh, are people who are really interested in the mechanics, right? So these are people who might have been, um, uh, maybe they're war game players, right? Maybe they do like, you know, little tabletop figures, like, um, like they do Warhammer. the hand painted, yeah, <laughs> Warhammer, yep. Yeah. Uh, maybe like they really enjoy building characters that have like okay. the best possible statistics. Maybe they really like theory crafting. Um, and I'd say that those are like the two ends of the spectrum and most groups are going to fall in one of those. Um, and so the first thing that you know is like, if you're interested and you have maybe a group or a specific person has asked you like, hey, you want to come join? Or someone's trying to start up a new campaign, like ask about that. Like, what is the focus, right? Are we, you know, are you really interested in sort of like more of a combat driven system? Are you really interested in collaborative storytelling? So that's a big first thing. Um, Cause there's, there's different ways to do it, right? So like I, yeah. particularly when I'm DM for, DMing for YouTube, dungeon mastering, uh, you also hear DMing <laughs> game mastering. Um, yeah. That's the, that's the person who plays everyone who is not a character and controls the world. Okay. Um, and, and everyone who's not a player character and controls the world. Um, and usually does most of the math off screen. Uh, yeah, so make sure you're aligned. Okay. Um, and also, uh, it's okay to make mistakes, right? Um, finding groups, it can be challenging. I will say one nice thing about particularly the last couple of years is that there's more and more folks who are willing to play online as opposed to like going over to someone's house, um, which you know helps with accessibility um, and uh, is nice. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's really the main challenge is like finding the group. Um, and I would also recommend don't have a group of people who are all completely new to tabletop role playing games. You want at least one person, probably the GM, who, who has been familiar with this. Um, and just know that there's a lot of variety out there. I don't know. This is all very sort of like generic advice. Yeah. But, I think that, but you know, if all you've seen is like, um, let's say you've watched an actual play, right? Like if all you've done is watch Critical Role, uh, right. a popular actual play, um, know that there is an enormous variety. There's a bunch of systems other than Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is a very rule heavy system. So it tends to draw on people who are more interested on sort of like the mechanical technical aspects of things. Um, where something like Dungeon World, for example, is, or, you know, totally real human adults, um, one page systems tend to be much less mechanic-y and more focused on the role playing. Um, and there are, you know, infinite, <laughs> infinite, not infinite, but many, many role-playing systems. Yeah. And if you are interested in playing, I think interacting with or consuming an actual play can be a really good way of mm. seeing how role-playing works. Um, so, you know, I mentioned Critical Role, very well-known. Um, some of my favorite actual plays are actually not Dungeons & Dragons. So I really like... Um, uh, the one shot network, right? So they have okay. a show called one shot, which is a one shot is when you complete your play in a single session. A session is usually a couple hours. Okay. Um, so our totally real human adults was a one shot. Yes. Um, uh, they also have a couple long running, uh, campaigns. So they have, um, Skyjacks is the current one before that it was, it's great. It's, you know, uh, explicitly anti-colonialist, uh, sort of, high fantasy skyship. It's a hack of uh, a system designed for Star Wars. <laughs> so like the, this airships use the like, you know, spaceship mechanics. Um, but it's also very, very storytelling focused. Um, so those are two good ways to sort of like dip your toe in. Um, and also just, I like the, the one shot network. Uh, James is a great DM. Uh, and then I also like um, Spout Lore, which is a Dungeon World podcast um, from a bunch of comedians. Uh, and I will say it's it's very um, enjoyable if you have a high tolerance for dumb jokes. <laughs> um, and also, like, it's a very good story. It's very well edited. I really enjoy mm -hmm. listening to it. Uh, there are some, like, dumb jokes and just, like, be prepared for that. Um, there are dumb jokes and one-shot stuff, too. Um, and yeah, so those are two that I'd recommend that I just like as, okay. as listening material. Um, and if you, once you find an actual pay that you like, one good way to find people to play with is to, you know, support them. Usually they'll have a Patreon. Usually that includes a Discord. Usually one of the things that people will do on Discord is organize games. So if you're like, I have no idea what sort of system I want to play, um, 
find an actual play that you like listening to, right? Mm -hmm. Because usually the people who enjoy listening to the same sort of actual plays that you do are also going to share your goals in that, you know, on that, that spectrum. And it's probably going to be pretty close to whatever the show is just generally as a a general uh, rule of thumb. So that was a very long winded answer. No, this is perfect. You brought it home because I was like, but how do you find the people, Rachel? That's so smart, right? Like you find, and I think that you could probably extrapolate that to anything, right? Like find the people doing the thing that you enjoy and then figure out how to get into their Discord or Slack or closed forums or whatever and go from there. And it's, yeah, I think that's such a great and beautiful way to think about finding community, finding the people who like the things you like, (laughs) um, especially in this world where we are ever connected and accessible and you no longer have to rely on the kids in your neighborhood to hang out not that the kids in your neighborhood aren't cool but sometimes like I live in the suburbs with a bunch of parents like nobody's gonna play (laughs) role-playing games with me yeah and then you get to fight your first big boss as a group which is scheduling yes (laughs) the Uh, real uh the real uh enemy that is scheduling is the hardest part so but we got this scheduled which is that's all that matters. <laughs> no, no tornadoes have interrupted this broadcast. So we're on the web. You are all over the web. Where are the best yes. places on the web for us to find you? Great question. Uh, at one point in the past, I would have said Twitter. So I am at R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N most places. Um, okay. So actually YouTube just introduced handles. So youtube.com yes. slash at, at R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. Um, that's my Twitter that's my website. Um, my Mastodon is rctatman at rctatman.com. <laughs> right, because you rolled your own server. I did. I did. Yeah. So fancy. Um, but, you know, I'm, uh, like we said, I'm a little bit leery <laughs> of putting all my eggs in one digital basket, as it were. Uh, and if I can be the one holding the basket, I don't always want to do it, but sometimes it's nice. Uh, yeah. And then probably the easiest way to keep up with my content, um, is I have a YouTube channel, I have a Twitch, and I also have a newsletter, um, which I'm going to be trying to be a little bit more consistent about sending out. Uh, and that is at, I think it's tiny letter, R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. Let me double check. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's tinyletter.com slash R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. Sure is. Yep. Um, so if you want to sign up for my newsletter and get a very occasional email, it, roughly monthly. But I remember. I love it. That's perfect. 